for those who know me, I'm Simon. I work here at Catalyst as a Python developer. Oh. Didn't apply my settings. Apply. This configuration. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I'm a Python here at, uh, I'm a Python developer here at Catalyst, working on the cloud team. Um, and this is my talk about programming in logic. So I want to start with a riddle called Einstein's riddle, allegedly. It's, uh, it's one of those things that's attributed to Einstein, but nobody can actually verify. But everyone calls it Einstein's riddle, so we'll keep that. Um, now, I won't spend too much time uh, going through the details of the riddle at this slide, uh, at this stage, but I just want to introduce you to the nature of the riddle. Um, so there are five houses. Um, there's a bunch of attributes about each house. Um, the Englishman lives in the red house. The Spaniard owns the dog. Coffee is drunk in the green house. And there's all these constraints and properties between houses, pits, um, preferred beverages, um, what kind of cigarette the owner smokes. Um, so there's 15 constraints in total. And the question is posed, who owns the zebra and who drinks the water? Um, now, if you notice through all of the constraints there, um, there's no mention of zebra and no mention of water. Um, so we're going to try and figure out, deduce from all of these facts, who might own the zebra and who might drink the water? Right. Um, so I want to introduce Prolog. Prolog is a programming language. Um, uh, the name Prolog comes from programming in logic. Um, so they just took the first part of both words and stuck them together. Um, it is the love child <laughs> of uh, natural language processing and logic programming. Um, it's the result of some research by two, two French researchers and obviously, obviously their teams underneath them um, who were in pursuit of a good way of um, processing natural language, which in 1971 there weren't really that many ways of doing it. So the first version of the Prolog language that they devised in 1971 um, was, it, it was the first prototype. Um, and it was a crazy idea. Nobody had really tried it before, um, but it was proving successful. And between 1972 and 1976, they um, created subsequent versions of the language, which got progressively better, more refined. But again, the, uh, the original premise for the language, the first working prototype was around 1971 or 1972. Um, Prolog today is still relevant. It has commercial application in AI, re AI research and development. Um, wow, that picture is really big. <laughs> um, namely, it's used by IBM in their Watson AI computer. Um, again, uh, what uh, IBM used it for natural language processing, um, as that's what it's designed for. Prolog is a declarative programming language, which if you are a programmer um, by profession, um, you may have come across this term before. Um, but for those who haven't, declarative means that we tell the language what we want to do, what we want to achieve, and we allow the computer or the language, the compiler, to actually define how it's done. So rather than telling it every single step, we just tell it what we want, and it goes away and finds the result for us. Um, another example of declarative programming language w languages, which you might be more familiar with, is SQL, which is 
uh, the query language, and it is also declarative in that you don't tell SQL how to get your data. You just tell it what data you want, and you allow your database management system to interpret your query, go away, it builds query plans and all sorts of black magic, and what you get back is the data that you asked for. Um, so SQL is another declarative language um, that a lot of people don't realize um, that they're already familiar with. Um, Prolog has its roots in formal logic, as I said. Um, does anybody know what that means? Has anybody studied formal logic? Oh yeah, so a good number. Well, um, for those of you who haven't, I'm going to go through a quick primer of formal logic. For those of you who have, it's a refresher. I know I <laughs> remembered how much I forgot while I was putting together these slides. Um, so formal logic, uh, the mathematical discipline of formal logic in the four easy steps, distill a problem in the real world uh, down to a simple mathematical notation, apply rules of influence, something, and you have a, a proof. Um, and it's a way to try and abstract the real world and reason about it. There are lots of different kinds of logic, um, and we're just going to look at two today, uh, briefly. Um, yeah, I didn't do great at logic. That's why I couldn't remember step three. Um, this is an example of a very simple um, statement in English. Um, if it is raining, then it is cloudy. It is raining, therefore it's cloudy. Now, to us that seems very obvious and intuitive. Um, and in logic terms, we would say that that argument is valid. But going back to formal logic, um, it's a mathematical discipline, and we have to be more rigorous about these things. So. We can apply this rule of, in, uh, rule of inference called modus ponens, which is P implies Q and P is asserted to be true, therefore Q must be true. And if we go back to the problem, then we do actually have a problem in, in this uh, layout. Um, if it is raining, then it is cloudy. It is raining, therefore it's cloudy. So this argument is valid both intuitively and we can prove it mathematically as well. So that, uh, that form of logic is very simple. It's called uh, propositional logic. Um, there's another form of logic called predicate logic, which introduces a few extra things. Um, it's like a more powerful form of logic than propositional. So the first thing we'll introduce is universal quantification, and that is uh, talking about a set of objects, and we can say for all objects in the set. And uh, down the bottom there, that is the notation for that. Uh, we don't really need that, but it's just interesting. I think so. Existential qu quantification. Um, again, if we're talking about a collection of objects, um, we can assert that there is some object X that exists. And the third one is uh, predicates. And so predicates define properties uh, or relationships between objects. Um, so for some object X, X is cool. And we write that as C of X. And for two objects X and Y, if x is adjacent to y, we could write that as a x, y. And so a is our predicate, x and y are our objects. And that's an assertion about the, pro the objects x and y in relation to each other. Right. So uh, using, using these constructs, we can start building models of the real world. Um, relationships between objects such as from our riddle, uh, the Englishman lives in the red house, which noting the um, prefix notation, we can re re represent as 
L-E-R. We can also combine quantifiers and predicates. Um, so combining the existential quantifier and the lives in predicate, we can say there exists some X such that X lives in the red house. Or all X live in the red house. And we can go on. It starts to get interesting, <laughs> to say the least. But that's really all we need to understand to start uh, looking at Prolog as a language. So Prolog programs consist of facts and rules, and those facts and rules are like predicates. Um, generically, we can refer to facts and rules as clauses. Um, that's like an umbrella term for them. So we'll look at our first fact, which is Simon is a human. Um, now, we'll just assert that and assume it's true. Um, at the bottom, we can see... <laughs> At the, at the bottom, um, I've put the predicate notation, um, but in the middle of the screen there is how we would express that as a pro prologue program. Um, so the predicate and the object in, um, in prologue, we call these constants. Simon is human. And note uh, that in prologue, uh, this fact ends with a full stop. So once we have a fact, we can start querying our facts. Uh, so the notation for this is that um, facts start with a question mark hyphen. So if you see that, it means we're querying the, uh, for a fact. Um, so if we query, uh, is Simon a human? Prolog will tell us true, um, because that's what we told Prolog. Uh, but we can also use variables. And variables should be understood uh, not in the imperative programming sense, where we assign a value to a variable, um, x equals 3, uh, name equals Simon. Um, they should be understand in the algebraic sense, like placeholders, um, where we want to solve x. So if we write a query and replace my name with a placeholder x, what we're doing is we're asking Prolog, does there exist some x that x is human? And Prolog looks through the facts that we've told it, and it says, yes, I know that Simon is a human. And so it will return x equals Simon. So that's a very simple um, query with one variable. Um, so we can take this and we can do an exercise. Family trees is like the fizz buzz of Prolog. It's one of the first programs that you really look at because it doesn't rely on too many um, difficult constructs. And you can do some interesting things with it. Um, who here is familiar with Game of Thrones? Oh, man. OK. Well, I wish I'd put in a family tree. <laughs> So we're going to define some facts. Just keep track of the names. We're going to define some facts um, where we relate um, parents, mothers and fathers, to their children. Um, so there's two characters in the show, Jamie and Cersei, and they have three children between them, Tommen, Marcella, and Joffrey. And so we can represent these relationships with these six facts. So if we query Prolog, um, who is the father of Tommen, then there's one fact that matches this, and that's Jamie. Um, if we reverse the query and, and ask Prolog, uh, for Jamie, uh, what values of y satisfy this query? Prolog can come back and tell us um, any value of y which makes that statement true. And if we replace both variables, uh, sorry, <coughs> both constants with variables, then Prolog will actually spit out every combination of x and y that makes the, the father fact true. Um, so that's the key, key concept with 
per log. Um, it really only deals with true or false. And when we're placing these variables in here, um, what we're asking Prolog to do is find values for X and Y that make this true. So we could go further and define some sibling facts. Um, Tommen is Marcella's sister, Tommen is Joffrey's sister, and Joffrey is um, Marcella's, uh, I keep saying sister, but I mean sibling. Um, but that seems inelegant, really. Um, if you had a lot more children, or you were trying to model something in the real world that wasn't children, um, something where there's lots and lots of different relationships you want to define, then it gets really big, really fast, and you end up lot of writing a lot of code. So we need to find a better way to represent this. And Prolog gives us this in the form of rules, which I mentioned earlier. Rules are another form of a clause. And rules let us define relationships between facts. So uh, we can define a rule for siblings. Um, so if we define siblings as being X and Y are siblings, if X and Y share a mother or father, then we can express this in prologue as uh, sibling X, Y, I don't want to read the whole thing. <laughs> but it, uh, X and Y are siblings. If um, X shares, uh, if X has a mother Z, if Y has a mother Z, and X and Y are not the same person. Now, we also need to do the same for father. And then we can start querying, querying this for who are siblings. And so again, what we're asking the prologue for is for which values of X and which values of Y satisfy the sibling relationship. And it will return three values. Um, we can do more relations, aunt or uncle. And we start to get um, a, lot of, a, a, lot, a lot of power out of it with very simple definitions and a few number of facts we can start to get a lot of information out of these rules. Now, Prolog has some other constructs. Lists uh, are a key one. Um, so, so lists can contain numbers. They can contain constants. Um, you can also nest lists. And to get items out of lists, uh, the notation does get a bit weird. Um, because we have this notation, uh, if bar r, which means the first part of the list and then the rest of the list. So if we consider the list a, b, c, then if bar r equates to if is a, r is b and c. Um, so r is just the rest of the list. Right, so something we commonly want to do with lists in other programming languages, Python, um, is append items to our list. And if you read the documentation, it seems like this is a fairly intuitive use case. Um, so we have the clause append, which takes three arguments, uh, A, B, and C. And the output C is the result of appending B to A. Um, so the use case down the bottom there <coughs> seems fairly intuitive. We give it list one of one, list two of two and three, and Prolog tells us that list C is one, two, and three. <coughs> but remember, what Prolog is doing here is actually finding a value for C which satisfies, which makes true the rule that C is the result of appending B to A. And so it's actually going through a lot of different values for C until it finds one that matches. And then it tells us what that is. And so because this is prolog, <coughs> we can also do this, where we, pr instead of uh, putting a value for C, providing a variable for C, we can provide a list there and ask it, what do we need to provide for B to make this fact true. 
And so this is where my brain really starts to hurt, but also where Prolog becomes wonderful because you stop thinking of things um, linearly and you start to really understand that all it's doing is trying to make the fact true and it does a lot of the work under the hood for you. So if we give it the final result that we want, we can also ask it for what values of A and B do we need to give it to make this true? And <laughs> yeah, it can tell us um, all values of A and B that satisfy this fact. So it gets really interesting um, and it's a really bizarre different way of thinking about lists and depending to them. There's one more variable uh, that I want to introduce, which is the don't care variable. And if you see in the middle of the screen, it's a just an underscore. Um, so we can use this like a regular variable. Um, but we, what it means is that we don't actually care what that value is. Um, so Prolog can put any value there and we're not interested in, in what it means. Um, so for lists, uh, again, if we consider the list A, B, C, then if bar don't care will tell us that F is A and we just won't get any information about what's in the rest of the list. But that's fine because there's cases where we don't actually care. We just want to know if F is the first element of the list. <coughs> so we can use all of these constructs that I've introduced to start reasoning about Einstein's riddle. Um, so I've just put it up again. Does anybody want me to go through it all the way from the top? No, cool. <laughs> So each house has five properties. Um, there is the nationality of the owner, the pet that lives in the house, the cigarette brand that the owner prefers to smoke, the drink that the owner prefers to drink, and uh, the color of the house. And so we can re represent that as a fact. Um, so we have a house fact, um, owner, pet, cigarette, drink, and color. And that's just like a really big predicate with five variables. Now, this is where the magic happens. We can define a rule, houses, which succeeds when H is a list of five facts that collectively satisfy requirements two to 15. Um, damn, trying to explain this in English is really hard, but Essentially, we're, what we're asking Prolog for is a value for H where H meets, where H is a list of houses that meet all of the requirements. And we're just going to let Prolog figure out how to actually, um, how to actually permutate over all of the properties to come up with that list. But we need to be able to load in all of the constraints. So the first constraint, there are five houses. Um, we have a function length, which finds the value for H, that H is five, five um, facts long. And now we can start on the more interesting ones. So the Englishman lives in the red house. Um, so we have our fact. Uh, the house, we know uh, the Englishman lives in the house, the house is red, and we don't know about the rest, so we'll just say we don't care. Now, the member function around it, it's just saying, make sure that H is a list which contains a fact that meets these requirements. And so we can iterate over all of the requirements. The Spaniard owns the dog. Coffee is drunk in the greenhouse. The Ukrainian drinks tea. Until we get to this one, the greenhouse is immediately to the right of the ivory house. We need to define a rule for um, houses being next door to each other. Um, I'll provide the source code. 
so you can look over it in your own time because Lord knows it took me hours and hours to try and like reverse engineer this. But um, my indentation's gone. Uh, but we have a rule that uh, houses next door to each other if, sorry, two houses A and B are next door to each other. If A is next to B or if B is next to A. So we can use our next rule to say house, the ivory house, is to the right of the greenhouse. The old gold smoker owns snails. Cools are smoked in the yellow house. Milk is drunk in the middle house. The Norwegian lives in the first house. So here we see an application of um, our F bar R notation, where all we want to say is that uh, the first house in the list is a house where the Norwegian lives. And we don't care about the rest of the properties of the house. We don't care about what else is in the list. We're just asserting that the list H must look like this. Um, so another constraint where houses are next door to each other. Cools are smoked in the house next to the house where the horse is kept. This one was um, a bit harder to read, a lot easier to write in prologue. So we've got a few more of these. And that's it. We've, we've loaded all of the constraints into our function houses H. And so houses H is now a fact that we will ask what value of H meets all of those requirements. And so that's the hard part done. We just need to do a little bit more work to actually get the value out. So we have a rule for who owns the zebra. So for what value of O is there a house in the list of houses where the owner owns a zebra. Now, we didn't define in our facts uh, any, any, um, any zebras, and we also didn't define in our facts any waters. Um, but it doesn't matter because we use the, um, the don't care notation. So if they weren't defined, there'd be a couple of blank spaces in our, in our set of facts. And we can just infer that that could be a zebra. So there was only one fact which didn't have any value for the pet. And that was the owner of the Japanese, uh, the, the Japanese owner. Same for the water drinking rule. Um, it's the same rule, we're looking for any house um, any value for D and we're in the list of houses there is a house that drinks water and that house is the Norwegian house so yes that is, that is prologue um, it's a lot of fun it's a fun way to think about programming it's a fun way to think about logic and if you are interested to know more, um, I'll put my slides up and there are some YouTube videos and some papers that you can do for further reading. And this is where I got a lot of my information from.